Welcome to True Crime and Wine. I am Sherilyn Dale and I'm so glad you found me. We have a lot to go through today. We are going to get right into it. Before we do though, I have a quick message for you. It's that time of the month again where I get to sing the praises of our beloved sponsor, HelloFresh. You all know I am such a fall gal. I'm the one who is prepping for Halloween in June. If you follow my Instagram, there's lots of Halloween memes. Just super excited. But I'd be lying if I said this year I really wasn't feeling the blues of the end of summer coming. I'm trying to soak in every last minute of summer fun. And the last thing that I want to be doing is spending any of my free time at a grocery store or wasting money on delivery. So HelloFresh is helping to ban my summer blues and taking the stress of how I'm going to handle it all this fall, but by having the meal prepping handled for me. And that might sound dramatic, but I don't think I'm alone on this one. My family, especially with growing kids, they are hungry all of the time, all the time. The fact that HelloFresh has snacks and sides of over a hundred add-on add -on items, so excited I can't even talk, that I can add to my weekly HelloFresh order is it's truly a game changer. We have enough back to school shopping, planning. We're like in this new transition of the year, like just too much on the go. And it's these times when I find that I'm wasting more money on delivery because like by the end of the day, it just completely has gotten away from me. I haven't even considered what we're going to eat, let alone try to go grocery shop shopping and plan for it. I've got nothing. I've said it before, I'll say it again, HelloFresh truly changes that for us. It's 25% cheaper than takeout and less expensive than grocery shopping because it's already pre-packaged. Your meals are already ready for you. They're pre-portioned, the ingredients are there so you're not overspending on ingredients that you're not gonna use. Last night we went with the most delicious spin I have ever had on chicken and vegetables and rice. It was their breaded chicken with buttery veg veggies and garlic sauce. Like I'm never ever going to eat this meal a different way. It, it's gonna be that all the time. The honey with the butter and the sauce on the veggies. Like I, all I just wanted to do is just eat the whole pan. I'm always salivating during these videos, but it's so good. I'm not gonna lie, the first like thing the kids said when they looked at it was like, I don't know if I want those veggies. It's like the famous line. But I said, try it first, which is also my go-to line. And I'm not even lying. We did not hear another word from them for the rest of the meal. You know, when everyone is just so starving and everybody is just like looking at each other and they're not saying anything. The only thing we heard from them was after they were done eating. And I kid you not, they asked for more, which I think kids are always like the biggest test because they're so honest. And if they're wanting to eat more, well, I mean like, then you know you nailed it, which is why I just keep going back to HelloFresh. If you haven't already, you absolutely have to give them a try. Go to hellofresh.com and use my code 50 Sherilyn for 50% off plus free shipping. That's hellofresh.com or click the link in my description in the box of this video here and use my code 50 Sherilyn for 50% off plus free shipping. Thank you again so much HelloFresh for your support, not only for me in the kitchen, but here on my channel as well. All right, a few weeks ago, I did a video on Larry Hall and in there, there was, you know, mention of, could he possibly be tied to this case? I know that there have been some bigger creators who have covered it, so I didn't know if you guys wanted to hear about it, but a lot of you said you did, and it's one that has haunted me for so long, so um, I would like to share it with you. This completely baffles me. I still don't even know what to think or who to look at. It's just, it's insane. It's been over 30 years since three Springfield women just disappeared, like literally just vanished without a trace and have not been seen of, heard of, found since. 
20,000 flyers are being put up all over the city in hopes that someone, anyone, might have a clue as to what happened to Levitt, Streeter, and McCall. can't imagine my daughter disappearing off the face of the earth and not knowing what, what has happened to her. Susie Streeter, who was 19, and Stacy McCall, who was 18, had just graduated, like just graduated from Kickapoo High School. And they spent the evening of Saturday, June 6, 1992, doing like the whole party circuit to celebrate. They weren't supposed to go to Susie's house, but just a last minute plan brought them there where Susie lived with her mother, Cheryl. Sometime between the hours of 2 a.m. and 8 a.m., 9 a.m., the women vanished with absolutely nothing but the clothes they were sleeping in for Stacy. That would have been only a t-shirt and her underwear. And you'd figure a site like that, if you saw it, especially with the community being so busy with grad, grad night, no one saw anything. And even more puzzling is how did somebody get in if somebody was responsible and took them somewhere? How did nobody hear anything? How could one person, were there multiple people, take three women in the middle of the night and no one has seen them since? Like, it's, it's, it's haunting. Now, it was Stacy and Susie's good friend, Janelle, that first discovered that they were missing. Janelle and Stacy had been friends ever since they were toddlers. Their families were very close. They grew up very close to each other in Battlefield, and, like, their parents would watch each other's kids. The two girls were inseparable. They went to the same school together, and then in second grade, they met Susie, who was a year older than them, but she had been held back a year in second grade. And the three of them immediately clicked and were like a little trio. And then the McCalls moved when Stacy was about 11 years old. It was just for a brief time, just a couple of years, but during that time, then it was just Janelle and Susie. And then when Stacy moved back. Things were a little bit different, like the dynamic wasn't as tight. They were still friends. But Janelle's version of, of how that relationship transpired after that was just, it would be more of like a, a twosome each time, either like she would hang out with Susie or she would hang out with Stacy. It wasn't usually just the three of them together. When they went to high school, Stacy kind of went off with like the more popular group and then Susie started hanging around with like a little bit of a, a rowdier crowd and then Janelle was just kind of like in the middle and was like the staple of you know keeping that connection there between the three. She said a couple months before graduation though the three of them had like gotten that closeness that they used to have in childhood. They were spending a lot of time together and so by the time graduation rolled around all of their plans involved being together. So at 6 p.m., the graduation ceremony had wrapped up at Hammond's Student Center, and the plan was to hit a couple parties. There was one happening right next door to Janelle, and then there was another across town that they were going to go to. And then after that, their final stop was going to be at a hotel that they were going to spend the night in, in Branson, so that the next morning they could hit a white water water park in the morning. Stacy's mother, Janice, said that when Stacy had come home to get ready to go through the party, to all of the parties, um, she was eagerly excited, you know, trying to get out of her grad dress and into her comfier clothes. And her mom was like, just one more picture, please, trying to savor the moment. And Stacy was like, Okay, I, I'm pretty much feeling a little bit smiled out right now. The face hurts. How much longer do you need? She's just like, one more. So she put up with it. Her mom asked if they could cut her graduation cake that was waiting for her in the fridge. And she said that they that she, she would do it, but they would do it the next day. She just really wanted to get get out there, just let let loose, celebrate this graduation. And then she she'd be back home the next day to do all of the stuff with her family. Back at Susie's house, her and her mother, Cheryl, were celebrating with a pizza. And this was no surprise to her friends that she just wanted to get back at, at home, have dinner with her mom, and then get ready to go out with her friends and celebrate. She was very big on including her mom in all of her milestones and even canceling 
plans with friends often just so that she could spend time with her mom. The two of them were like best friends. One thing that I thought was really cute of them was that they would usually like make tapes for each other of their favorite songs and then leave little notes on them. After dinner, the plan was for Susie to go off with her friends, stay the night at the hotel, so Cheryl was going to have the house to herself that night. And her plan was to varnish some furniture that she was redoing and hang up some wallpaper border in their house. It was a new house. They had only purchased it about two months prior to Susie's graduation. So Susie and Stacy met up with Janelle at Janelle's house and they went next door to the first party. Sometime during the party, the girls had all decided that they were just going to play it safe. They weren't going to make their way to the hotel that night and they were just going to stay at Janelle's house and then in the morning they were going to drive there. So Stacy made sure to call her parents and let them know they were very nervous about her going out that night. Graduation was quite a trigger for them because at their graduation evening, two of their friends were killed in a car accident. So they were a little bit on edge. So Stacy wanted to make sure they were, you know, up with all of the plans. So they, she called them about 10 p.m. to let them know that they were going to spend the night at Janelle's house. After she spoke with her mom, the three girls went over to the next party. This was on East Hanover Street and the party was it was quite loud neighbors had complained about it and the police arrived and they showed up around 1 40 in the morning to tell everybody party's over clear out so Susie Stacy and Janelle went back to Janelle's house where they were going to sleep anyways and Susie and Stacy's car was there by the time they got to Janelle's house Janelle's mom had set out like a little living room bed situation for Susie and Stacy to sleep on and then the plan was for Janelle to sleep on the couch because they had family relatives visiting for that weekend so the house was pretty packed by the time they arrived at Janelle's house Susie and Stacy had decided you know what instead of staying here where it's like really busy let's just go back to Susie's house because it's nice and quiet we'll get some sleep we'll be able to wake up early the next day and go to the water slides it was just Susie and Cheryl who lived there. Janelle de decided to stay at her house and sleep on the couch that evening and then Stacy followed Susie behind in her car to Susie's house. The next morning Janelle calls Susie's home around eight around eight and nine somewhere in between there to see if they're ready to head out to the water park and there's no answer so she leaves a message just figuring everybody's sleeping in but by noon when none of the girls had called Janelle she just immediately was concerned everyone was so excited to go and celebrate and go out for the day so it concerned her enough that she drove to Susie's house to check on them, wake them up. Janelle went over with her boyfriend and she was just figuring it was just going to be like a really quick like, hey, you guys get up, let's get ready, let's all meet. That she went in the car without her shoes just to go and knock on the door and wake them up. And when they got to Susie's home, they go to the front and they're looking through the door and they notice that the porch light outside is broken. It's shattered on the ground. And so while she's looking around doing some investigating the windows to see if she can see any movement because all three cars are in the driveway. So she figures they must be sleeping. Her boyfriend sweeps the glass to the side so that she doesn't get glass in her foot and so that he can just like do a nice thing and take care of this glass so that Cheryl doesn't have to do it later. In their mind, they were just thinking, oh, you know, somebody might have just bumped it. They did not really think that it was anything sinister at all and that they were just doing a courteous thing. This is the kind of area where I, I feel like we've been doing a lot of these cases where it's in these areas where everybody is pretty tight-knit, knows each other, you don't lock your car doors or your homes. So it was no surprise that the door to the house was unlocked and Janelle and her boyfriend went in to see what they could see inside because there was no movement outside at all. But again, 
they see all three women's cars in the driveway. Janelle opens the door and she's immediately greeted by Susie and Cheryl's little Yorkie uh, Cinnamon. And Cinnamon is very yappy, excited, and kind of like panic. You can you can definitely tell when a dog is feeling a little bit anxious and that was the initial feeling that she had coming from Cinnamon. So she just starts calling around the house each of their names like Cheryl, Susie, Stacy, are you guys here? And nothing. The house was silent except for Cinnamon who seemed to be in distress. The scene was so bizarre though because it wasn't bizarre. There was nothing that seemed out of the ordinary. She went through the living room, the kitchen, the house was tidy. She went into Susie's bedroom and she said that it was like a little bit messy for like a teenage messy though nothing looking like there was any sort of um, disturbance or fight. And just based off of her initial look into the bedroom, it did appear to her that someone that they did spend the night there or at least like crawled into bed because the bed was the the sheets were pulled down the comforter was pulled down a little bit the girls graduation dresses were hanging in the bathroom you could see that Susie and Stacy had washed off of their makeup there was a damp cloth with their makeup on it and their clothes that they were wearing that evening were neatly folded on a pile so it looked like they would have gotten into PJs and all three of their purses were in there. Even Cheryl's purse was in Susie's bedroom. When she went to go see if everybody was maybe like bunked up in Cheryl's bedroom, no one was in there, but it also looked like Cheryl had slept in her bed as well. Her comforter was also pulled to the side and then on her nightstand was her glasses and a book that was turned open almost like she was in the middle of reading it and then was like okay I'm just gonna put this down. One of the first things that Janelle thought was really odd was that their purses were all there. In Cheryl's purse there was $900 still in it and in Cheryl and Susie's purses were their cigarettes and they were known to be um, heavier smokers where even if they were just going out temporarily they wouldn't have left without their cigarettes. Janelle and her boyfriend's first thought was maybe they had just gone to a, a friend's house that was also going to go with them to the water slides so they just popped over and headed to this friend's house to check there but he said they weren't there he was actually still sleeping so they went back to Susie's house to wait and see like maybe they did just quickly pop out somewhere and were totally over overthinking things. When they got back there they waited for a little bit and there was nobody who came home so then they started thinking okay maybe they're at a, a lunch place getting something nearby so they started driving to like local shops they were looking on every street as they were walking seeing if or as they were driving by seeing if the ladies were walking anywhere and nothing by this point they're concerned but they're not thinking they've disappeared something has happened they're just like frustrated of not understanding like what's going on especially because they had had these rock solid plans that everybody was excited for and the girls did like a really good job at being good friends, keeping in contact with one another. So if the plan had shifted, they would have known about, Janelle felt like she would have known about it, but she didn't. But they're just trying to talk themselves out of it. I think that's, I've said it before, a natural response in situations like this. Meanwhile, at the same time, Janice, Stacy's mom, is also worrying. It's now the middle of the day on this Sunday and she hadn't heard from Stacy. And Stacy had made a promise to her to keep in touch. She already knew that she was on edge the night before and had already done like a really good job at trying to ease her mom's concerns. So when she hadn't heard from her by the afternoon, Janice calls Janelle's house because for Janice, this is where she still thinks Stacy had stayed that night since it was just a very last minute decision to just spend the night at Susie's and she didn't want to call and wake up her parents in the middle of the night. It's Janelle's sister who answers the phone and Janice just says, are the girls up yet? And she says, 
um, yeah, Janelle and her boyfriend are gone right now. And she said, oh, okay, well, can I talk to Stacy? And this is when she finds out that Stacy didn't stay there. And Janice is like, oh, no, I know they were supposed to stay at the hotel, but she was going to stay at your house last night. And that's when she learns that the plan had changed again late, late at night and that Susie and Stacy had decided to go to Susie's house. So Janice hangs up and she's just a little bit upset that her daughter didn't say anything or at least didn't call in the morning to let her know of the plan. And she's kind of thinking that she's gone on with the plan to go out and celebrate during the day and that she was gonna give Stacy a talking to later. So she calls over to Susie's house. There's no answer and she leaves a message on the answering machine for Stacy to call her as soon as the message is received. That day, Janice's mom, Stacy's grandma, was in from Oklahoma and the plan was to go and watch um, a miniature boat race. So even though she was a little bit frustrated with Stacy, there was no concern. She just figured it was, you know, teenage behavior. So they went on and did that. But as the day was going on, she was calling Susie's house and leaving more messages and getting like a little bit more frustrated as the messages were being left. It wasn't until she got home and received a call from a friend of hers. It was a mother of one of Stacy's really close friends that she became concerned. It was this mother that was hearing from Janelle and friends that Stacy's purse and her car and Susie's purse and car and Cheryl's were left at the house, at Susie's house, but no one has seen them or been able to get a hold of them all morning. Correction, by this time that she actually spoke to her friend, this is like all day. It's it's a the, the sun was starting to set at this point. So Janice brings uh, one of her other daughters with her and they decide to drive to Susie's house and the plan was for her to collect Stacy's things and for her sister, Stacy's sister, to drive Stacy's car back home. And she was kind of like, you know, I'm gonna take these things. When Stacy arrives, she's gonna be like, where, where's my car and where are my things? And worry a little bit like we've been worrying all day. When she arrives, she does the same thing that Janelle did, looks in, in the house, sees if there's any movement, there's none. She lets herself in, turns on a light and starts looking around. As she's doing that, other people start arriving at the home, other friends that are now really concerned, other family members that are worried. And there's about 20 people that are walking through the home just trying to bounce ideas off of one another. The reoccurring thought was maybe Susie and Stacy were somewhere and they just forgot to call. But Janice just didn't feel like that was right. There was a point once where Stacy had tried to sneak out. She actually went to a, a party at a hotel, I believe, and her mom caught wind of this and showed up there and was waiting for her outside. So it was something that she never did again and assured her mom she would always you know, be in contact. And, and for whatever reason, if the girls had decided to go somewhere and just forgot to tell everybody, it wasn't making sense that no one had also not spoken to Susie's mom, Cheryl. Another thing that really concerned Janice as she was looking around, aside from the fact that the purses were still there, the cars were there, was that inside Stacy's purse was her migraine medication. She suffered Pretty, from pretty heavy migraines and it was just m way too much to bear that she would never leave without her medication, similarly to how Susie and Cheryl wouldn't leave the house without their cigarettes. As everybody is looking around the house, trying to see if there's some clue as to where these women are, all of a sudden this phone call comes through on the house phone, which is kind of like exciting, nerve wracking, chilling all at the same time because the house has just been like so quiet. No one knows what's going on. And now the phone's ringing and Janelle decides to answer it. She said when she picked it up on the other end, there was a man's voice and he just started like spewing off a bunch of like vile sexual things to her. It creeped her out. She was like, what the hell? And she hung up. Right after she hangs up, the phone rings again. She picks it up. And again, like just disturbing 
things being said to her on the other line. And so they check the the voicemail after she hangs up and see if there's any anything that they can lead to like who's calling or maybe even the girls have been somewhere and they left a message for them to check. And on the answering machine, they come across another super rude, crude, lewd, lewd, crude, rude, ooh, message. But when they went to go play it back, they couldn't. The way that this answering machine was set up was once you played the message, it was deleted. So they had no way of listening to this again, seeing if they recognized the voice, or sharing it with authorities, which is where things were at. At that point, everybody in the house had come to the, the general consensus that it was time to notify the police. They didn't want to call 911, though, because they didn't know if this was an emergency. They didn't want to make something, you know, like out of nothing and that there was this innocent explanation so they phoned the local police department instead and when the dispatcher answered she said no you should call 911 and Janice said no just please take down the address here and just have somebody come out and so an officer did when the first officer arrives he sees there's a house full of people and trying to get all of the information from everybody as he's walking around the house he also doesn't see anything that is of concern in Susie's bedroom. It looked like somebody had slept in there. The TV was still on. The girls' clothes and purses were there. And one thing that he did notice though was that like two slats in like the window blinds looked like they had been separated as if somebody was looking outside. Maybe they heard a noise in the yard. Aside from that though, nothing was amiss. And he even said to Janice, you know, do you think like they might just be out somewhere? This is really exciting times. It's graduation. They're not, you know, like in a regular pattern of being like, oh, okay, like I'm, I'm gonna check in right now. It could just be an afterthought. That's when Janice says to him after she had seen Susie's bedroom and that the clothes they were wearing the night before and the grad dresses that, well, if they are somewhere, then I know that Stacy is only in her underwear and a t-shirt that she can sleep in because her clothes are here. And the officer suggested, you know, maybe she decided to wear something of Susie's where Janice was like, no, she wouldn't fit Susie's clothes. Like this is all that she would have been wearing. So he takes her concern seriously. And by the time the second officer arrived on the scene, he gives him a brief and they both agree. Like the scene is like very eerily calm. The only thing that looks like any form of struggle is this light on the porch that's broken. But unfortunately, with good intentions behind it, it was swept to the side. So they don't even know what the placement was, if there's anything left behind. Same with this message that they're hearing about. This, this is another potential piece of evidence that is now gone. So they're basically starting with just like, absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing to go off of. On top of that, we have to remember that they're looking at now not just a m missing person who's going to come back, which they get numerous calls from. It's, it's a regular occurrence, like, oh, I can't find my child. And then there's just always an innocent explanation. But now this was serious enough for them to uh, file an official missing persons report, open up an investigation, and while they're deciding this, they have like 20 family members in their house contaminating, contaminating, gosh, what is now a crime scene. At this point, they agree that they need to just have everybody clear the house. So they close the house. They grab the keys to lock the door. And Janice says, you know, like, oh, well, if they come back, how are they going to get in? And the officer says they can come to the office to retrieve the keys. And then we know that they're safe and sound. And they can also personally come and close like this missing person investigation. So he leaves just this handwritten note on the door with his phone number saying, please call and come in, collect your keys and cancel the missing persons report. Two days go by though, and they don't hear from any of the women. And at this point, the decisions made to call the FBI and ask for assistance. And they start off by just trying to learn as much as 
possible about these three women if they knew anybody in their life that could be responsible did they live like a high risk lifestyle what you know there there has to be an explanation behind them just vanishing they looked into Cheryl's background and there really wasn't a lot to go off of. She had been married and divorced twice. She and her first husband had divorced not long after Susie was born and she took Susie and her older son, Bart, to live in an apartment together. I guess uh, her first husband was wanting to be divorced but then thinking that they could still live together and she could like collect money some I don't know what what his thought process was but Cheryl was like I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go out on my own I'm not gonna I don't need any any funds from you and she actually was able to stay at this complex by uh doing work around and fixing it up and so she got to stay there for free eventually she had remarried again and then gotten a divorce again from her second husband and this one impacted her finances quite a bit. He uh, had just kind of gone off the grid and no one could get a hold of him and so creditors were calling her looking to her for his debts to be repaid and even though she hired an attorney and like tried to find where he was I don't think that she ever did. And so in 1992, in April, that's when Cheryl and Susie had decided to relocate and move to their the house that they went missing from in Springfield. Cheryl's described as a very private person, not somebody who talks about everything that's going on in her life. The closest person in her life was her daughter. She did have a lot of clients though. She was employed at, at New attitudes hair salon i think that's a really cute name for a hair salon because like you know every time you get out of the chair you kind of just do you feel like you have a new attitude it just kind of came to me like very cute but anyway so she had about 250 clients she was very good at her job clients loved her and she was just considered to be this model employee so that also added to the urgency of finding them and knowing that something was wrong because can't come that monday Cheryl didn't show up for work. At the time of her disappearance, Susie was working at a movie theater. Her plan after graduation was to enroll in cosmetology. Beauty uh, was something that she was really interested in and especially following in her mom's footsteps. And she had some insecurities when it came to school. So going off to like a college and majoring in something was not what she really wanted to do she found learning very difficult she was put in classes like for students that had learning disabilities and her friends looking back on it think that she was dyslexic but just didn't um had like any formal diagnosis for it and found school you know quite challenging Stacy's plan after graduation was to attend Southwest Missouri State University. She was going to be going there with her good friend Janelle and they were even talking about maybe like trying to pledge for a sorority. At the time of her disappearance, she was a receptionist for Springfield Gymnastics Club and then she was also modeling on the side uh, wedding dresses at a local bride shop. Her family and friends said that she was someone who dated occasionally. She was very like conscious of the way she looked. She was always put together and beautiful but at the time of her disappearance she was just focusing on her going to university she didn't have a boyfriend at that time one of Susie's ex-boyfriends was spoken to his name was Dustin and a few months before the women went missing he had actually been caught breaking into a mausoleum and stealing like gold teeth from a skull it wasn't like gold teeth now that I say that I'm like envisioning like like a mouthful like gold teeth it was like gold fillings and it was only $30 worth so police did look at him they spoke to him because I guess Susie had given a statement that they needed when they questioned her about the things and the things the break-in the robbery the the tooth filling robbery um and then there was rumors that had started to flow that oh maybe he had was responsible because Susie was going to be a witness and he and his friends were known to be in that area and together but nothing came of that and that's really like 
where those early days, the investigation just like kind of started and then halted. One of the early theories was that if this was a stranger, how did they gain access to the house, like get in and be able to take everybody out? And they thought that maybe once everybody had gone to bed, they opened the door. Remember, nobody usually locks their doors in this area and lured Cinnamon, the dog, out and then went to the door as a ruse to be like, hey, I found your dog, gained access and was able to overpower the girls, the women. Another thought going along this luring them out was that maybe somebody had come to the door saying that they were a, a city worker and that there was some gas leak. There were so many theories going around. There were so many tips being called into the police station. And even Stacy's mom, Janice, was just getting like a number of calls. Some of them would be people that she believed were trying to assist saying like, oh, I, I think I saw Stacy over here at this gas station. And so she's kind of clinging to the hope that she's alive and also filtering that to the police. But then she was also getting really disturbing phone calls. Some people had called and said that that the women were cut up into pieces. They were fed to wild pigs. And it's just so effed up that it's, it's so effed up that that's actually not unusual. Like, what's our line, you guys? What the fuck is wrong with people? Like, this is something that happens so often in these cases. People reaching out to family and just effing with them as if they're not going through enough. Like, I, I just, I can't. That being said, there were also like a lot of amazing people who were trying to help as best they could. There was a 24 hour command post set up at Cheryl and Susie's home. A massive search party was launched. And when I was reading about the search, I started to think of the phrase like no stone left unturned, which seemed like it was completely executed. In those early days, there was police, volunteers, they were riding horses, they were walking through fields, there's tall grass, small bodies of water. They dug up ant hills that people called in thinking that, you know, like maybe this was just like freshly dug grave because the dirt was disturbed. They were also chasing like buzzards and stuff to see if there was any clue or remains somewhere. Within days, there was over 20,000 missing persons photos of the women just plastered all over the community. Basically, every telephone pole, shop, window, restaurant, truck stops had the faces of Cheryl, Susie, and Stacy. It was obviously drawing, drumming up a lot of attention locally, but the main thing that the police department wanted to do was get national attention. At the end of that first week of them disappearing, they posted a segment on America's Most Wanted, which had led uh, about like 30 calls. 48 Hours also did a special where they shadowed the police during this investigation and had like a several episode segment. This did drum up some hope. There were in so many investigations though, like Janice was getting calls that were going nowhere, just leads that were sending them on wild goose chases. But on the first week that the women had gone missing, there was a drawing of a nearby apartment complex. And on the drawing, there was like handwriting and it said, use ruse of a gas man checking for a leak. And this was left in like a Smitty's magazine rack. And even though it wasn't Susie and Cheryl's home, it led them back to the idea that, okay, did somebody lure them out of the house? And that's how they were able to like overpower them. Unfortunately, that didn't lead anywhere. The next day, they did start getting calls that neighbors in the area had seen a, a transient man near the home with longer hair and a scruffy beard, and nobody knew where he belonged. They did release the composite sketch, um, but it also didn't lead anywhere. Then there was a tip given that a green van was also seen in the area. 
one of the neighbors who called this van in was certain that she had seen it on June 7th, the day that the women had vanished. And this woman said she was just enjoying her coffee on the porch and saw this van drive to up the girls or the women. I don't know why I keep saying girls. Up the women's driveway. She said a young blonde was driving it who looked like Susie. She said she looked scared um, and she could hear but couldn't see, but could hear a man's voice saying, don't do anything stupid. Now she said she didn't report this for several days because she was scared. And by the time she did contact police, there were actually other reports that had come in, other tips that had come in, sorry, of this sighting of an older green van. The problem is sometimes the van changed color. So sometimes it was dark blue, it could have been like a dirty brown, it was this this gray or gray and green color. One thing that was consistent though was that there was this van that people noticed and that's where I started to think of Larry Hall because if the color was changing depending on the day, it could have, it, it very well could have been Larry. I had mentioned in the Larry Hall video, if you wanna check that out, I'll have it linked down below for you. If I forget, which I'm known to do, you guys, I apologize, thanks for always keeping me in check, but it's just, you know, Sherilyn Dale, Larry Hall. But I will try to make it easy for you. The The thing with Larry is he, he was a serial killer, if you haven't seen the video, I'm just keeping you up to speed here. Serial killer who traveled and he would go to Civil War reenactments. And so when women were missing in that area and they started to look at Larry, they would see that it was consistent with the times that there was a Civil War reenactment. And according to what I could find from that video, there was a reenactment nearby around the time that these women had gone missing. But Larry's van wasn't green. It was like a taupe and brown. So if other people's description of the van are different according to like their perception on like colors, sometimes that happens. That's why hairdressers always tell you to like bring in a photo of the exact thing you're you're wanting and explain what about it you like because our perception of colors are different. So, and if this green is not like a, like a teal obvious green, but it was an off shade of green, that could make sense. Now, the only problem that I have with, with the Larry theory is that this woman had said she, she saw Susie driving and there was actually another call from a gentleman who also saw a blonde girl driving a van and Larry wouldn't be in the passenger seat. He was always the driver. With this one lead from the gentleman who'd seen the girl parked in the van at the grocery store, there was just something about it that seemed off to him, enough for him to jot down the license plate, which is actually how Larry Hall got caught but he had jotted it down on a newspaper that he was reading and just unintentionally wasn't thinking about it that that's where he had wrote it down, had thrown that newspaper out and it was gone. The police though believed him so much that, th that his gut, that something was just off about this van was strong enough that they even tried to hypnotize him to try to remember the license plate, but they, he was only coming up with three digits. He couldn't figure out the full license plate. The van seemed to be like the biggest thing and the, the thing that caught the most steam to begin with. They ran every registered van in the United States that matched that description. There was even this like moss colored green van that they painted and they parked it in front of the police station for weeks, hoping that somebody would look at it and it would like spark a memory for them. Unfortunately though, this is another dead end. It didn't lead anywhere and some investigators were really on the fence about it. They thought, no, like it's just a coincidence and, and everybody's just trying to help and it, that it wasn't involved at all. And there are others who really strongly believe that, that, it did, that this van did have an involvement with the girls. And that's where I get like the heebie-jeebies when I think about Larry Hall. From the traction that the van was getting, more and more people were starting to think like, hey, 
can I assist? And then more calls were called in with tips. There was a waitress at Georgia's Steakhouse. This was actually one of Cheryl's favorite restaurants, so they were familiar with the women. Said that she saw the three women at the diner around 1 and 3 a.m. on June 7th, and she said they left together. And the waitress thought that Susie was, like, giddy, like, maybe a little bit intoxicated, and that Cheryl was just trying to, like, calm her down. So from this lead, they thought it was promising that, okay, maybe they left this restaurant and someone intercepted them at that point, but there was a hope that somebody, like, just had them. But there was the reward for $3,000 in the, in the very early days. After this tip, um, it jumped to $40,000, and it was, like, a secret gift, so nobody knew who had pledged this money. Next, a tip comes in from a police informant. He suggested to look at Webster County, and so a search went out there. Police said they did find items on the scene, but they never elaborated on what they found, and the search warrant is sealed. I looked into this from what I could tell. I'm not like a investigator. I try very hard to get like as much information as I possibly can for you. Make sure that it's as factual as it can be. Sometimes I'm able to like find records and that's really great. Other times I can't. And so for this, I couldn't. I don't know if this has ever been unsealed. I don't think that it has though, because technically this is just still like a, it's an ongoing investigation. A few months later on September 15th, Cheryl's son, so Susie's brother, he was considered an initial suspect. Again, there's not much to go on of why he was looked at, but he, after being questioned, quit his job, left Springfield, and had not returned. I don't want to make any speculation. I think that this can happen with a lot of people. I mean, surely now in social media, you know, social media days, 2023, we can see the damage that can be done when somebody just picks up an idea and just runs with it and it just snowballs and there's the cancel culture and the mob coming at you. I it, right, it obviously wouldn't have been that intense in the 90s, but you can imagine if you're in a small community and eyes are staring at you. I mean, there could be a number, number of reasons as to why why he left. Then entered a family who had gone through a horrific loss, who didn't know Susie or Stacy or Cheryl, but had come across the story on the news. And it was a mom named Dorothy Zellers. She was at her home in Florida watching the news and sees the missing person poster of these three beautiful women it caught her eye and she started listening to the case watching it was a huge trigger for her because it started reminding her of her daughter her name was Sharon and when she was only 19 years old her life was ended because she was r-worded and unalive now as she's watching this all she is thinking about is the man who had been convicted of killing her daughter in 1978. And the reason why she kept thinking about him is because the Florida Supreme Court had released him. This happened only three years before these women had gone missing and he had moved back home to live with his parents who happened to live in Springfield. Just a quick synopsis on Sharon's story. It's just chilling and infuriating and if he had anything to do with it it's just even more frustrating because it's like one of those cases where it's like oh this should not have happened so sharon was a 19 year old who was getting ready to go to college but she loved her job had a great job at walt disney world she worked at the Frontierland trading post gift shop that was a mouthful so on December 30th, 1978, she is called into work. She actually wasn't supposed to work that day, but her coworker was sick. She loved working, so she agreed to go in. And she finished her shift and left the park at 10 p.m. and never came home. It was five days later that her body was found. She was 
severely beaten and she was stuffed in a sewer. This sewer was less than 350 meters from a motel where a guy named Robert Cox was staying at. He was 19 at the time and he was on vacation with his parents. Now he wouldn't have been somebody who's a, a suspect that you're gonna wanna talk to and know that they're in the area just off his resume, he was a highly regarded army ranger. But the reason he caught attention is because on the night that Sharon disappeared, he returned to the hotel and he's bleeding profusely from the mouth. Part of his tongue was bitten off. And he tells police that he had gotten into a fight with somebody who was trying to mug him and this mugger pull the Mike Tyson on him. That wasn't a phrase then, but you know, it is now. This is like OG Mike Tyson and, and bit it off. There was no evidence to tie him to what happened to Sharon. So he wasn't arrested. He eventually was charged, not arrested, but that was eight years later. And he was charged because he was already serving time in a California prison for kidnapping and assault charges on two women. So he was brought back to Florida to stand trial in Sharon's murder. And I guess part of the reason why it took so long was it was really hard to put a case together for the prosecutors. A year after Sharon's death, Robert was named soldier of the year. So it's like, okay, if this is the person responsible, he's clearly living this completely double life. Ultimately, the evidence came down to the fact that he was staying at a hotel just meters from where Sharon's body was found. Police also said that there was a shoe print in Sharon's car that matched a military boot. Ultimately, a jury decided that Robert Cox was responsible for Sharon's death and he received a death penalty verdict. However, while he was on death row, Florida's Supreme Court decided that the evidence that they had to convict him just wasn't enough and overturned it, leading him to be released and free, which actually enraged the jurors. They There were a few that were very uh, outspoken and expressed how angry and insulted they were. It's like, we came in to do a job based on the evidence that was presented. We felt like certain, like without a shadow of a doubt that he did this. And if he's released, he's gonna do this again, which he was released and Many of them have said like, we will, we would never, ever, ever be a juror again. Like the, the jury pool is tainted now or the jury system, the legal system being a juror. I'm, I'm just going on a tangent, you guys. Anyway, they never wanted to do it again. I can't even imagine the devastation that that would have been for Sharon's family, but it's one of the reasons why they were always keeping taps on him. They, they even also said, if, he's released, he's going to do this again. So they wanted to know where he was. And that's why they knew that he was in Springfield at the time the, the three women disappeared. Something else that does add a little bit more weight to the Robert Cox theory is that he was working as a utility locator and he worked in the area. So that could have been falling into the idea of a ruse, somebody being able to lure them out. And surely if he had a uniform and looked professional, there would be no reason why these women wouldn't be very trusting and like kind of let their guard down initially. He was interviewed back in June, 1992, but at the time he said he had a rock solid alibi. He said that he was at church with his girlfriend the morning the women disappeared and had been with her prior. The problem with that is years later, his now ex-girlfriend admitted that, that that never happened, that he asked her to be an alibi when the police came, came a knock in. So when this change of story came to light, the Springfield officers interviewed him again. Once again, he was in prison. He was in Texas for robbery. Just adding to the burglary, kidnapping, murder resume. And this time he started toying with detectives. He said that he knew that the women were dead and that they were buried near Springfield. And as he's doing this, he's like smirking at them. Just like, that's all I'm gonna give you. 
and you know do with that what you will and that really is all he gave like they had to leave he wasn't he refused to talk more they went back and tried to interview him again and it was basically the same thing which is just not enough for an, an indictment and he wasn't only messing with the police but he was also writing into a journalist explaining that he was aware that he was being looked at as a potential suspect, that he had been interviewed, and that he did admit to telling this detective that he knew where the bodies were. And he said like he he wanted closure too. He wanted to, you know, stop all this, stop the harassment and everything. But he if he told them where the bodies were, then they'd come after him and seek the death penalty and he didn't want that. Which is so effing devastating and so frustrating for the family. Like, I cannot imagine. Janice, Stacy's mom, has, she's been so vocal just trying to keep her daughter's story alive. And then you hear something like that and she's like, well, you know, let's make this make sense, Robert. Like, if you're, if you know something, like, the least you can do is just tell us and try to bring closure. And to this day, this is, like, literally the only, the only traction like suspect that has seriously been investigated and who keeps coming up time and time again but it just it goes nowhere one thing that um is reoccurring when you look into this case and that investigators want people to uh, think about is that the new years so going into like the new year which 1995 so the girls went missing on in 1994 so on New Year's Eve of 1995, there was anonymous, an anonymous caller that called through on the America's Most Wanted switchboard and had information that seemed to be promising and wanted to speak to the investigators. And it was enough for this operator to patch them in, link them up with the Springfield investigators. But the, the call got lost they never were able to connect and this person didn't call back and police really think that that could have been an important lead and it made me think too like a lot of times people will see an episode of something and you hear somebody knows something I say it a lot on here too but it's true somebody does know something and oftentimes in those monumental moments of like the year, you know, like New Year's or Christmas, calls come through. It's almost like this, this repent, like let's start off fresh. Like I've got to get this off my chest for people. And I think that's kind of where the investigators were feeling like that possibly could have been going. This was just somebody who, you know, maybe even had a little bit of liquid courage to speak about what they knew but this person has never ever called back and they desperately desperately want them to now there's also a lot of um public criticism all throughout all of these years that the case was really mishandled the first year by the police chief at the time where people say that he like really micromanaged and was trying to just like control every aspect of the investigation wasn't even wanting like his own detectives to communicate with each other like just take the leads and the tips were coming through and then deal with it on their own and then they were handed like tips accordingly so it just kind of sounds like a cluster F, but also I wasn't there, so I don't know. I know that at about the 10-year mark, there was a new detective that came on the case and basically wanted to come in at in it with like fresh eyes, barely even wanted to like go through the the notes and the case file that was already there. Just look at it with like pulling some of like the critical stuff and then seeing where the investigation led from there. And allegedly authorities have a list of about 10 people that they haven't ruled out and then Robert Cox is at the top of it but they don't want to put all of their eggs in you know the Robert Cox basket. My understanding I don't know if it still is today but from the last time that Cheryl and Susie's family spoke out was that they truly do believe that Robert is the one responsible. It's so sad because only a couple of years after Susie and Cheryl went missing. Susie's grandfather, Cheryl's father, passed away. And he passed away, like, believing that this man did it and was free. So Susie's uncle has spoken out about, like, that the family has discussed it. They 
they feel like maybe just because this is the only lead and, and had gained as much traction as it had, that's why they keep going back to thinking that it's him. But then they're left with also the realistic possibility that this is just some sick F who is trying to toy with them, which is just so, ugh, it's just so disgusting for the family. You know, like the, it just uh, does not allow the pain to go away. Like whether you know or whether you don't know, like if you know, just say something, Robert. And if you don't, then just like back the F off, Robert. So here we are, it's been over 30 years. And now the only recent attention to this case that I have seen was in 2019 when Susie's brother was arrested. He was arrested on February 28th um, on suspicion of public intoxication, disorderly contact, conduct, not contact an attempted false imprisonment after there was like an incident at a nail salon in Tennessee. Now I came across an article that I wanna just, just skim over with you for a second here, um, talking about that. So the what the media had taken, the family says was very exaggerated. So initially the, um, the accusations were that he walked into a, a nail salon and that he was claiming to be the grandfather of a 15 year old girl that was there that he came to pick up. And this person did not know Bart, did not go with him. That was the headline. And then so after a statement was um, released from Bart's family saying that it was really irresponsible to kind of have this clickbait and run with it where he did not try to take this girl, but asked if the girl was the granddaughter of a woman that he was talking to in the lobby. I guess there was surveillance and it does show that he walks in, he shakes hand with this woman that's in the, the lobby. And at no time in the video can you see him try to like forcefully take somebody out of this establishment. And then they said, you know how painful it is for the family to try and deal with a this embarrassing situation is kind of what they're calling it. They're saying like Bart has not lied about the fact that he has this long history with alcohol abuse. He's spoken publicly about it, knows that he needs to get help. And so it sounds like maybe he was, you know, walking by a little intoxicated, walked in, struck up a conversation with this lady and then was like, oh, is that your granddaughter? And then it was just like all bad vibes. And then the story exploded. So this is what, where, they are denying it. I I, ha I was not able to find anything that said like he was actually charged and like convicted and did jail time for this like attempted kidnapping. And then his family is saying like with this, all that does is just just re reignite the pain that we're feeling of not knowing what happened to our girls. And that's just one of those reminders that like when we are learning about a case, there's a family behind it, right? Who deals with this every day over 30 years. Like I cannot imagine just going on trying to live on a daily basis, just not knowing. I was able to find that Janice Stacy's mom was a co-founder and executive director of a foundation called One Missing Link. It was a non-profit organization, but as of August 14th, 2023, which is when I checked in to see if it, it was still around to see if we could help in any way, it says that it was inactive. So I don't know if it's merged with another organization. I know that there was an article that I read where Janice was just explaining like how she's trying to keep afloat like with her life and her bills all while trying to still find her daughter and what happened and then pour into this organization as well. And she was saying how financially straining it is. And I totally understand. I mean, like my whole purpose of wanting, of starting the Sippendale Foundation is to help alleviate some of that financial strain. But in the same sense, you need to come up with the finances. And like, we, we are so lucky to like have the donations we do, but it's like in nowhere of the wheelhouse where we need to be to make a huge impact. It takes time, like anything. So I can see where maybe it didn't get the traction that she wanted it to initially. So that being said, like if, if there's a new organization that anybody knows about or how to get in contact with Janice and figure that out, like how we can help, I'd love to know if you could reach out to me and let me know how we can help in any way. Cause I, you know, coming from somebody who's trying now to also get a nonprofit like buzz in and really, really, really impact and make a difference. I mean, we ha we've helped and I just, but I see, you know, like I, I see the bigger picture and I want to get there and it just 
it just takes time. So I'd love to be able to help her. I just don't want her to be discouraged because I know that it can be frustrating. And I have a, like a much larger platform than sh that she would. So yeah, okay. Basically what I've got for you to wrap this up is that this is, this is still very much unsolved. And it, I think of like a cold case and I think it's extremely cold because of just where it, like what options were there at the very beginning between like a contaminated crime scene, possible evidence being destroyed. I just like super, super frustrating. And just one of those that I'm just like, oh my gosh, like why can't we solve this? And I, I go through so many theories. I go, you know, maybe, yeah, Robert Cox, maybe Larry Hall, maybe just somebody who was, you know, stalking them from these graduation parties. I don't know. It's everywhere. And I just wish we could figure it out. As I, today, I still believe that there's a $43,000 reward in the like arrest and prosecution of the person who abducted these women. And I'm just gonna put this out here because like I've already said, if you know something and you need to get it off your chest, I know like a lot of people will follow up on cases that they possibly were involved in or know of somebody that was involved in to see where things are at. And this is where it's at. We need help, okay? If you were the caller, on New Year's Eve, please find it in you again. I don't know what I don't know what we gotta do. I I do not. This is ugh, I gotta go. It's just it's just it's just too much, and I just want to do more. This is where I get frustrated because then I feel so helpless and I just have to end the video. And I'm like, okay, like let's solve it. I gotta go. <laughs> All right, I love you so much. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. I was gonna be like, oh, here's the answer to this week's riddle. And I, I just realized I didn't give you a riddle. So apologies for that. Okay, um, and if you haven't and want to check out the story of Larry Hall, it's very, very fascinating when you try to, I hate saying the word fascinating because that seems like, like a good word, but you know what I mean? Like, it, <laughs> I really, you guys, I really have to go. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm just rambling. But if you wanna check out the Larry Hall, I will have it, I'm gonna have it like, linked right here somehow. Well, there is a link button. You guys can just click it, check it out, and let me know what you think because that, once I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, maybe it was Larry. And Larry's still around to get talking. Okay, I'll see you in the next video. I'll miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.